Okay, welcome to this uh, survivors session of the uh, what's been an excellent RSA conference. I think we can all agree with really enjoyed it. It's been great to see old friends and meet new friends and um, have conversations. It's been absolutely brilliant. So a big congratulations to the RSA team for a wonderful conference. So uh, if you don't know me, I'm David Bailey. I'm chairing this closing plenary session on mission oriented to never say that word mission oriented policies and regional economic transitions actually i'm the token male on this on the panel because we've got two brilliant women and regional studies is very concerned about gender balance so i'm here just to make up the numbers and um, <laughs> um mission oriented and challenge oriented approaches have become increasingly popular in recent years in a number of different areas of public policy notably innovation policy and have started to be applied in lots of different ways, regional innovation policy, regional policy, and other areas. At the same time, there's been concern about how, how that approach relates to approaches that have been de developed at a regional level, and whether it might represent a return to a top-down approach as opposed to bottom-up. So the session is timely in unpacking and critiquing what mission-oriented and challenge-oriented approaches could hold for regional policies. I'm delighted to say we're joined by two excellent speakers in this area, Lisa Depropris and Michaela Triple. Uh, first up is Lisa. Lisa is Professor of Regional Economic Development at the Birmingham Business School. She's written widely on uh, innovation ecosystems, competitiveness, regional and industrial policy, and Industry 4.0, where she led the EU RISE project makers. She's going to speak on will mission-oriented policies work for regional transition. So, Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, closing plenary. It's been a pleasure being here. Uh, it really, uh, don't think words can 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 express it. And the what I'm presenting today is very much uh, something I'm working on, and it's uh, it. I'm, I want to open a conversation about whether mission-oriented innovation policy work for regional innovation and regional transition. This is something that is very much debated, uh, well, it started to be debated within the literature on innovation, but I think it is very timely that we uh, address these issues within, uh, within uh, regional studies. And what I wanted to do today is really to start by very quickly introducing, you know, the 4.0 technologies, and then I'll move on to uh, really say a bit more about what these mission-oriented innovation policies are, just in case some might not be familiar with them. I will then try to um, discuss whether the top-down, bottom-up tension is very much back, back in, 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 uh, in the debate and how we resolve it, in particular within the EU, when, uh, where we have, of course, that uh, innovation and regional policy are very much framed around smart specialization. And I will just finish off with uh, really two words about a possible, uh, a possible way of framing a, a, a way of reconciling these two, uh, these two points. Now, but I think there is quite a general agreement that these are the typical uh, 4.0 technologies, not just automation and digitalization, but also all the green related technologies. This is because the narrative around the fourth industrial revolution has really been uh, um, um, divided into big pillars a narrative around technological change, so robotization, automation, and so on, and climate change, sustainability. And I do want to stress that I think both of them are important are important parts of this transition, technological transition that we're going through. Um, the, the theoretical literature that we use, that one uses to understand technological change is the literature on system change. Um, this is really going back to the work on technological paradigms, uh, technological niches and, 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 and regimes. Now, this literature really explains why we have these waves of technologies that occur uh, um, in, in cyclically. And to some extent, what they do, they have this disruptive nature. They change sectors, they change also the way organization might function, they create new sectors, and also, of course, they might create all sorts of new markets. 
Now, um, this is a, a, a very famous uh, Perez uh, uh, hair curve on the uh, shift in te technological paradigms. And where we are, we're very much in that bit between 3.0 technology really started to decline and the 4.0 technology started to come up. That's the point of transition. That this phase, which is where we are now, is very painful, very costly, and actually we need to understand how to navigate it. And uh, um, what, we, what is happening is that we see these new uh, technologies coming, coming through, and we are in a phase of experimentation, of try to apply these technologies in, uh, in, in different industry, in different markets, but things are extremely hard still, because of course the incumbents are resisting the change. So this is why we have this tension between change and resistance that we are, that we are seeing. Now, a very good, uh, 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 of course, uh, para, uh, well, a framework to understand transition was provided by Gilles with his multi-perspective, uh, 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 multi-level perspective paradigm. What it did was really to explain where are these new technologies coming from. And so his idea of the technological niches uh, was really a way of um, trying to uh, point out uh, where are new ideas coming from and how do they interact with the mainstream technologies that, that are part of what he calls the social technical regimes. So we see that a transition really occurs when we have this literally clashing of new technologies coming from the niches into, into the existing paradigm. Now, we are talking about transition, and I really want to point out that we're talking about both green and digital transitions. I think both of them have to be taken into account. If you really want, in a sense, this transition to be sustainable and to be green and to be really positive for, for our economy and society. And uh, uh, there's also plenty of evidence that uh, really these two transitions are already un underway. Evidence on, for example, uh, you know, increasing use of robotization, digitalization. I just picked really here one of the tens and hundreds of, of data I could have picked up. At the same time, there's an increasing commitment to green energies, which is very equally growing, uh, despite you know, some of resistance, of course, but there is a, a, an increasing uh, momentum around, around that. What is also quite uh, 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 interesting is the way we always talk about, well, so far they've been treated differently. So there's a digital transition, which takes place mostly within factories and, and uh, in the production sphere and so on and so forth. And then there's this kind of uh, uh, energy and sustainability. But actually, we need to see them as intertwined. And this idea of twin transition is really emerging as an important way of understanding the depth, but the breadth of the change that we are seeing. So we talk about green transition when we see the in intersection between green and digital technologies. In some current work that I'm doing, I've tried to really unpack what they mean. And really the only way of, of, of seeing them is, um, in my view at the moment, as we try to build a, a debate around is to understand that it's really a mix of the two technologies. So on one way, we can have digitalized green transition every time we've got the adoption of green solutions, which are augmented in their, in their power with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the digital technologies. At the same time, we could also have sustainable digital transition, whereby digital transitions or digital technologies have also a very positive externality towards a sustainability agenda. And there's lots of examples of this, for example, in domotics, where we see a really good blending of sustainable objectives and uh, at the same time, the use of digital technologies, uh, equally in you know, smart farming, and of course, in the way in which we connect different sources of technology and mobility. So there's lots of ways already in which the industries are already redesigning themselves, blending sustainability with digital, digital uh, uh, change. Now, why is this important? This is important because really what we are seeing is that the depth and the breadth of the change is giving, a, 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 is giving an opportunity, an opportunity to, to resolve, to find new solutions to new problems. And the, the, the kind of 
system change literature tends to look at new solutions because it tends to be more science push. So it's really describing this transition from the emergence of new scientific technology and how this will change society and the economy. But of course, there are also new, new, new problems. So there are new problems that we need to solve, which were not the same problems that were there 30, 40 years ago. So we really need to really, uh, we really need to appreciate the combination between understanding the opportunity of the solutions, but also trying to anticipate and work towards solving new problems. So really, one of the key uh, issues around that, though, is to identify these new problems. Because it's, in a sense, once you have a problem, you can look for a solution. But how do you look for a problem? Of course, we do this now. We know we've got, uh, 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 and that's where we are moving now onto a more demand pool uh, innovation approach, whereby we see problems, we see issues that we want to address. And all the work by Manzucato has been in that direction is really about trying to identify uh, 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 challenges that need they need they need a solution. The key issue here is that uh, um, it's using frontier knowledge to really achieve a certain a certain objective, the mission, solve that challenge, address that challenge. Now, this demand pool, demand side type of, uh, of, of, of innovation policy, but also approach to, to, uh, to technological change has really, gaining, uh, has really gained uh, momentum. And uh, what we see is that the formulation of grand challenges, for example, around the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals is very popular. I mean, literally, I think every government now is aware of these issues. And what is, I think is very positive is that we thought uh, 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 these objectives to really be uh, um, objective for emerging and developing economies. But in fact, I think they've created a common platform for resolving common problems in a way that probably will really make the change uh, significantly uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, um, I'm not saying quicker, but certainly more, more um, uh, what's the word? Um, more, more sure in its in its uh, realization. So really, we are looking at demand-driven innovation. We're looking at setting up problems, identifying problems, and then see what technologies will solve those problems. So drive drive the innovation and the and the the, the innovation process uh, through the, uh, the 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 challenges that that, that innovation needs to the, to deliver. So this is the main, the main um, tenet of this approach is to look, look for a purpose or find a purpose, identify a purpose, and really use this purpose to drive technological change and, and innovation. And the idea was really in, in the work that Mazzucato really started is to use, for example, the, the Apollo mission as a benchmark. And what, what she did was to use that one as almost as a, a, a guideline. So what to do to use this or, or deploy this purpose-driven uh, innovation uh, approach. The key issues here are that uh, uh, to put a man on the moon, what they had to do is have really strong a government commitment, having a very, very well, well shared vision of what that commitment was in in the Apollo mission was also lots of money was spent on it and was used to do huge debate whether that was a, 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 a good way of spending the money but finally having the role of NASA to coordinate all that and all of you who have read this the the, the work I'm talking about really can uh, relate to to that so the missions are important and they drive the process of change and to the extent that they coordinate the effort of bringing together different technologies which are developing separately to find a solution to a single, a single problem. Now, I would think that this type of mission-oriented uh, uh, innovation approaches are very much similar to the science technology policy we used to to study a little bit in the past, whereby we are talking about a national level, top-down approach, 
which is uh, somehow providing the leadership, providing uh, a vision, but also choosing that important purpose. And this idea of intentionality in the prioritization of the different missions. So it means that it's not really a bottom-up and organic process, but a, there's a clear intention to choose these missions and to pursue them through a process of uh, technological change. Mm -hmm. The other important aspect of the science and technology policy were to have a key specialized stakeholder who can actually coordinate and provide leadership to, to, to those policies in the same way as NASA did within the Apollo program. Of course, they are top down. They tend to be space blind. Why? Because they are they're trying to really use the best of the best. You're trying to bring together technologies and uh, that are very much on the frontier for them to be then reconciled within the same, the same problem solving process. They are focused on technology and very much they could be um, uh, triggering processes of, of cross, uh, cross uh, uh, disciplinary uh, um, fertilization. This is the link with our twin transitions. This is why when we're talking about mission oriented policy, very often we see that digital and sustainable are coming together because they have to be seen as very much these two sides of the same of the same coin. So to deliver these mission-oriented policy, if they are at the national level, certainly I can see a, an increased role for national innovation systems, a way in which national innovation system will play an increasing role in coordinating, providing an infrastructure, providing uh, um, leadership, but also providing the instruments to deliver these, this process, which then will, uh, will uh, resolve the problem which is, is set up in the first place. Now, the European Union as well has, I think, made a very interesting uh, uh, attempt recently to almost set up a European innovation system through its big platform like European Digital Agenda or the European uh, Green Deal. The, the, the way in which the, this mission-oriented innovation policy work, as you can see from the chart, there are once can identify a grand challenge, could be you know, cleaning oceans, really big, big, big challenges, which are in a sense fundamental to, uh, to that it's a societal challenge, fundamental to our lives. These are then kind of, uh, they are translated into missions, and then uh, eventually these missions are achieved through projects that feed uh, that feed um, um, and, and uh, towards these these missions a key aspect of mission oriented policy is the directionality these are top down policies which means that the top will provide ambition a vision certainly a, a destination and that's the challenge now in my view the 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 the, the problem with that is that it means also prioritizing. You have to prioritize something as against something else. So some challenges will be prioritized as against other challenges, because of course there is a, 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 always a constraint on resources. It means also selecting. It means somehow backing some actors or some technologies or some sector more than others. But also finally, it means, it means you're excluding some. There's a process of, selection which will say some of these technologies will not need to be to be developed and as i said i think the european union has made quite an interesting attempt to um catalyze the, uh, um, uh, the attention but also the the, the forces and the 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 the, the, the the, the interest of a number of stakeholders around big big challenges like for instance as I said, the European Green Deal and the European Digital Agenda, or for example, the way in which it has shaped the European Horizon, the European Horizon Europe program, choosing specific area areas of, of intervention, which again they coincide with, uh, with, with challenges which have a huge, huge uh, 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 impact on economy and society. Is this is top-down bad? And this is a very important question. And I am not entirely sure. 
What I think, and I think this is something, this is the, why this is a conversation. We are at a critical time in our kind of technological change uh, 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 curve, whereby there is a techno technological race go going on. So, uh, you know, Europe, as much as Asia or the US, they are really racing, trying to control and to somehow develop technologies and have ownership of these technologies. Why? Because it, it matters. It matters who's controlling those technologies. It matters not to be dependent on other countries for those technologies. And of course, that is in itself a very important, a very important point that needs to be uh, taken into account. We are not at a phase where incremental change is occurring. We are at a point where radical new technologies and new techno technological paradigm is coming in. So, of course, big infrastructure investment will have to be to, will have to uh, uh, take place, and this requires, of course, a level of intervention that is national or even European in the European uh, Union case. However. This means at the very same time that somehow somebody has to choose ex ante the purposes, the challenges, the missions. Somebody has to choose what matters over other things that will not, will not happen. That's in itself, is, this is the, the problem of top down, is this, it's, a, it's a selective process, but also it's an exclusion process. And the other issue that I, I just want to draw your attention is that what by because the, 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 the technological race somehow is between really big parts of the world, big players, uh, each player wants to rely on the best and the brightest. brightest. So, for example, if you're thinking about uh, at the national level and the European level, this means that if you're trying to achieve a certain objective, there is a mission, you want the best possible resources working around that to achieve that mission that is great and that's what you want to do now that also means that at the spatial level which is what we're interested in here this could create increasing wider and wider disparities because some players will be uh, entering this tier of, of of technological advancement and other will will not so what we uh, what we, we so far what I've been saying is that both the literature on system change, you know, um, Schumpeter, even Carlotta Perez, they really see technological change in a space blind way. But equally, the mission oriented approach to innovation policy is space blind because it's looking at missions and is really top down. On the other hand, we know better than anybody in, you know, around that space matters a lot because technology uh, at the end of the day is implemented within industries and is uh, uh, um, therefore industry are spatially concentrated. So when we talk about technologies, they don't really fly about, but they tend to land, they anchored in places. And this, this is something that of course we know. We know why, because we know that place matters. We know that uh, you know specialization, agglomeration matters. We know that innovation is systemic, and of course, what we know is that there, there's a huge literature that are you know you know all this already. There is a path dependency problem. Just even before we start thinking about technological change, we knew there was path dependence at a time of incremental innovation. Um, so when we're looking at, at uh, the way in which transitions are occurring, we, need, we could start thinking about adding a spatial dimension to the, for example, the multi-level perspective, whereby these niches are located somewhere. And they then somehow uh, uh, connect with places where there are dominated by existing technologies in kind of 3.0 technologies. The, intersection and the meeting point between the new niches and the existing places is where the transition is taking place. But it's taking place at the place-based level. So I'm trying to take the conversation, we need to move it down a step where we're looking at what happens at places. In all these big conversation about really societal challenges, where is the place? Where are the local actors? Where, what is their role? And what we've seen from uh, initial uh, work on, uh, on the impact of 4.0 technologies uh, 
on uh, on uh, um, on regions we already seen that to some extent uh, 4.0 technology will um, uh, create will increase the level of regional disparities so we already know that 4.0 technology will somehow uh, uh, strengthen or still maintain a, a cleavage between high performing performing regions and low performing regions so there's no there is no convergence, but it will be increasing divergence. So that we see a, a divide, maybe a digital or an innovation divide emerging from, from the adoption of 4.0 technologies. And even before we talk about you know, challenge-driven approaches to innovation policy. I mean, Mazzucato herself is, 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 is suggesting that actually some spillovers occurred out of the Apollo program some unintentional uh, uh, consequences occurred. A trail uh, uh, is mentioned of application across, across many sectors. But we know trickle down doesn't trickle down. <laughs> and so expecting things to, act, to happen unintentionally, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that we know might not, might not necessarily be a, 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 a desirable outcome. We see already that the, the 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 approach, however, this mission oriented approach has been already uh, uh, um, embedded or adopted within within European regional policy, whereby this mission oriented approach has been somehow recombined with with uh, uh, smart specialization strategies, for example, in the formulation of S four strategies. So we see already that this approach is coming into play within innovation, systemic policies, because smart specialization uh, uh, is, of course, bottom-up, systemic, it, it involves stakeholders, uh, and, and it's very much place-based. So we see this multi-tier kind of level at the moment taking place. The mission-oriented policies are very much top-down. Smart specialization are bottom-up. I think we, I don't know how, but there must be a way of reconciling all this. Because my fear is that otherwise we're going to see really increasing a, a real problem of divergence, which is is even even uh, uh, more uh, more somehow um, problematic than just what innovation new new technologies will would bring in. So it's just about bottom up, but it's also about the middle and out, because if this the, the implementation of these mission oriented policy are really creating. Uh, uh, centers of excellence, uh, for example, at the national level, how are these really properly connecting with local places where there are no centers of excellence? So how we can create bottom up and middle and out approaches whereby innovation becomes pervasive because otherwise we won't have inclusive growth. There will be really exclusive growth. And this is not something that is, of course, uh, desirable uh, for, for, uh, for, for any country or region. Um, this is the kind of uh, nested innovation system that we are working on at the moment um, uh, with a colleague of mine, Marco Bellando. We're looking at how we can imagine the national, uh, the regional uh, uh, system has really been made of a complex, a complex uh, um, set of stakeholders, but we need to really include more stakeholders, not just the triple helix, but for example, clearly defined and clearly tasked stakeholders, for example, with environmental uh, objectives, which have to be part of that, of that infrastructure. Now, I want to very quickly, I've got a couple of minutes to conclude with uh, a, a case study that um, we are developing, we're developing three case studies, UK, Sweden, and Italy. And in the Swedish case, what is very interesting, which uh, um, is clearly Sweden is an extremely, extremely you know, innovative country, innovation tends to, to take place uh, within the regional innovation uh, uh, agencies, which they are connecting with this mass specialization strategies. You have the innovation infrastructure around the Nova. And of course, you've got the Swedish Research Council, which is very much in charge of allocating academic funding for research from the horizon, horizon Europe. As I said, Sweden, Sweden is a, a very innovative country, always coming top three or five in all sorts of innovation classification, has a very complex 
well-structured, well-oiled national innovation system, but also as an infrastructure that deliver also innovation policies at the regional level. And this is done in particular with the work of Vinova. And in particular, Vinova has a, a number of programs and it has had for about 12 years, a very interesting program that is called uh, Vimbex. And, and what it, it does, it really um, it, it provides support for the recasting, their reorganization of places which are going through industrial restructuring using a very much a bottom-up triple helix region innovation system type of approach. At the same time, in the last few years, they've introduced, for example, programs that are more technology-based, uh, like the strategic innovation programs. So they've tried somehow to create a matrix of places and technologies. And the places represent also sectors, like pulp and paper, for example. What are you going to do when you have forestry, you have pulp and paper, and nobody reads books anymore? How are you going to restructure that? It's through technology, but also by understanding the system that is in that location. Now, I was in Sweden this year, and I found out that, again, they're going through a process of reorganization of their policies, and they're really buying into this mission-oriented innovation policy, and they are introducing impact innovation programs, whereby everything goes through big challenges, big objectives, where really every stakeholder is invited to very much work towards that challenge. And the spatial element seems to be really lost in that in that process. And that somehow for me rang a bell because it is, it is the beginning of a wave whereby uh, uh, what was bottom up approaches are going to be more top down or it's just that there is an adjustment and we're just trying to find out a good balance between bot bot uh, bottom up and top down. So I think these are very much um, interesting times. So what I've been trying to open a conversation with you today is understanding the power at the moment the, the, uh, of, of mission-oriented innovation policies and how they are appealing to national governments because of their, the fact that they address big societal challenges and they enable them also to position their technological infrastructure versus other countries or other parts of the world. And there is a very strong perception of a technological race that seems to be therefore concentrating the minds more than really understanding that at the end of the day, all those technologies have to make everybody's life better. And so we cannot simply, I know they've got big challenges, but those big challenges have to be at the end of the day, very much uh, uh, go all the way down to individual households and people and localities. I think the challenge for this community to understand the literature around these issues and really trying to uh, uh, question where are the places in this debate? Thank you. Excellent, Lisa, thank you. I'm bang on time and I guess that raises the question of Houston, do we have a problem? Um, Moving on, our second speaker uh, needs little in the way of introduction. Michaela Trippel is Professor of Economic Geography at the University of Vienna. She's written widely on regional industrial development paths, transformation and policy, and across a range of leading journals. I'm delighted to say she's had two excellent papers in regional studies this year, which are well worth reading. Michaela is going to speak today on beyond mission-oriented policies for regional economic transition. So Michaela, hopefully you can hear us and over to you. Yes, thanks, David. Can you see my uh, my screen? Yes, we can. Super. So good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from uh, Vienna to London. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to take part in this closing uh, session of the RSI Winter Conference. Unfortunately, I couldn't travel to London. There are just too many meetings here in Vienna in, in relation to an evaluation of our uh, faculty. It's, um, it's really a nightmare, but um, so many thanks for, uh, for making it possible to join you uh, online. So uh, I am going to give a, a short presentation on, uh, on mission-oriented policies for regional economic transitions, or more precisely, why we might uh, wish to move uh, beyond a mission-oriented uh, approach. So then uh, let me start by, by saying that um, well, there is now a, a widespread uh, consensus that the 
current generation of regional uh, innovation uh, policies requires a critical rethinking uh, a reorientation the challenges and crisis of uh, of our times the climate urgency the resumption of uh, of inequality and other so-called uh, slow burn crisis as well as sudden shocks like uh, the ongoing pandemic and and wars like the one in the ukraine so they call for new policy approaches to support what uh, is termed uh, purpose-driven transformation. So approaches that help to, uh, as um, Ron Martin put it, approaches that help to build sustainable structures and pathways in response to societal challenges. And there are high hopes that new approaches such as the uh, such as regional mission-oriented, problem-oriented, or challenge-oriented um, uh, approaches could really help to promote innovation activities that drive socio-economic, socio-technical, socio-ecological uh, transitions that are uh, urgently uh, needed. So um, these new uh, these new regional policy approaches are uh, clearly inspired by uh, the broader literature on uh, new scientific frames for innovation policy, which are reflected in academic work on uh, mission-oriented and transformative innovation uh, policy approaches. Lisa has already mentioned uh, it. They are place uh, blind, so they lack uh, um, sensitivity and attention to context-specific factors that influence uh, transitions, but still they are uh, an important source uh, of inspiration for the um, the regional uh, regional versions and what these approaches have in common is that they uh, they really question policies that uh, focus primarily on innovation for economic growth they advocate a reorientation of uh, innovation uh, policy towards societal challenges they stress that innovation policy should not only influence the rate but also the uh, direction of innovation and that in this context, uh, a focus on fixing market failures and repairing structural uh, innovation system failures is not sufficient when we uh, talk about the core tasks or uh, goals of policy making and the reasons for justifying uh, uh, policy interventions. So just think of the mission oriented uh, approach. Lisa has done an excellent job in summarizing what this, uh, what this approach is about. Uh, Builds on the idea that grand societal challenges could be the or should be the starting point for uh, policy making, and that uh, these challenges could be transformed into clearly defined policy goals, and that policymakers should create and shape markets and not only uh, fix market failures. Um, or Schott and uh, Steinmüller, who advocate a new framing uh, of innovation policy, which they call transformative change. So uh, a frame that uh, refers to innovation as a means to uh, invoke radical system change. And this does not only involve technology development and shifts in production processes, but also changes in consumption patterns and, and ways of living. So transformative change, radical system change is seen as an essential strategy to address a diverse range of sustainability challenges. And this is very different from older framings, right? That the older framings that see the role of innovation in contributing to economic growth and frames that con uh, confine the role of innovation policy to fix market failures and uh, structural system failures. So the, debate is now clearly shifting towards what is called uh, transformative system failures, which uh, include directionality, demand articulation, uh, coordination and reflexivity um, failures. And these new frames have clearly informed national and uh, even more importantly, supranational policies. So in Europe, the supranational policy landscape is in transition. Just think of the European Green Deal, Europe's contribution to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, or the EU missions such as adaptation to climate change or the recovery and resilience facility that aims to uh, promote amongst other things, green transition, sustainable and inclusive growth and social and territorial uh, cohesion. And well, this has 
this is having uh, effects on current regional policy practices, which are guided by the concept of smart specialization, at least in Europe, but also in some uh, other parts of the world. And as you, of course, know, smart spec is a very advanced concept, uh, a concept that advocates uh, place-based and uh, evidence-based uh, innovation policies that uh, promote the modernization of regional economies and uh, uh, their uh, diversification into new fields, so uh, fields that could become new sources of growth. And these uh, diversification efforts should be based on on regional strengths and historically grown assets. So this asset should serve as a, a, a platform uh, for diversification. And there is now um, a, a rich empirical uh, literature that has analyzed how the concept has been uh, translated into uh, policy practice, of how it has been uh, implanted on the ground. And well, the empirical evidence suggests uh, that some regions have been quite successful in developing smart spec strategies, but at the same time, this empirical work also points to policy coordination failures and it points to uh, various prioritization and stakeholder inclusion uh, challenges, in particular in less developed uh, regions, so in regions with limited diversification potentials and weak uh, institutional capacities, one can observe um, the selection of priority areas that show a bias towards existing paths, incremental innovation, uh, so paths that do not really open up directions for future development. And there is also evidence that the inclusion of uh, stakeholders has been a challenging task, in particular civil society has not been uh, well represented. So smart spec has featured a rather elitist approach to innovation. And there is also a lot of evidence of uh, policy capture by uh, incumbents. And a fundamental critique of smart spec has been, and in a way still is, um, so the critique is that it is a rather conventional growth-oriented policy approach and that given the challenges of our time, a stronger emphasis on environmental and social, goal, uh, social goals is needed. And the good news is that um, smart specialization is on the move now. So recent work has uh, sought to uh, adapt the, the approach to respond to societal challenges. Um, based on a, a report by Phil McCann and Luke uh, Söte in uh, um, two years ago and other work as well, the Joint Research Center in Seville has recently come up with what is called the Partnerships for Regional uh, Innovation Approach. So this is a framework that seeks to uh, combine smart specialization with the goals of the European Green Deal and other EU policies. And the intention here is to uh, uh, is to link place-based opportunities uh, and, and, and problems to the new generation of um, EU policies. Um, the interesting thing about, uh, about the PRI, so the Partnerships of uh, Regional Innovation Approach, is that uh, it, it breaks with smart spec uh, as we know it, um, so because uh, it adds directionality towards sustainability to transformation. The, the, Euro, um, the entrepreneurial di discovery process should be replaced by a so-called open discovery process, which implies, amongst other things, to, to broaden engagement by including uh, new sets of stakeholders. And uh, more attention should be given to uh, coordination failures. So. Um, Overcoming policy silos is really a central uh, theme in, um, in, the, in, in, the play, in the playbook that outlines the, the PRI. So regions are now supposed to define their sustainable development strategies. They should identify local challenges and opportunities and link them to the uh, European Green Deal and other EU policies. And they're supposed to develop uh, transformative innovations that um, produce co-benefits for the economy, the uh, society, and the uh, environment. And uh, a, 
as you might know, a couple of months ago, a pilot project on the PRI was launched. This is the, the next big regional innovation policy experiments uh, in Europe. In this pilot exercise, more than 60 regions across Europe are taking part. And this experiment is an important one to watch. Uh, it remains to be seen how different types of regions will embrace the PRI, how they are going to incorporate PRI elements in their uh, place-based policy repertoires, how they will work with large stakeholder groups and what kind of transformative uh, innovations will emerge and, will, and which regions will, uh, will uh, benefit the most from uh, transformative innovation. And it will be interesting to observe how regions are going to ensure that economic concerns do not continue to trump uh, environmental uh, and uh, social issues. So there um, are a number of uh, other concerns with the, with the PRI or with mission-oriented uh, approaches more generally. As regards the PRI, it needs to be highlighted that uh, the, the partnerships for regional innovation are conceived as complementary to the smart spec strategies that regions have just developed for the new funding period. And this could mean different things, right? So it could mean that uh, some regions will just add some transformative elements uh, to uh, current conventional strategies, or it could mean that some regions develop transformative strategies which then exist side by side with more conventional strategies. This remains to be seen. Um, and the core question here really is uh, what will be the outcome of such policy layering or, or parallel uh, policy making exercises? We don't know yet what, what the outcome uh, will be. So, and then there, um, so with respect to, to mission oriented policies more uh, generally, there have been uh, critical examinations and uh, the argument has, put for, has been put forward that uh, a mission-oriented approach would constitute uh, fussy policy making, and it has been criticized for underestimating the complexity of today's mission. So the, the earth shots that are required to tackle uh, societal challenges, which are characterized by a high degree of complexity and uh, wickedness, are very different from the the, the moon shots, right? They are clearly defined scientific uh, and technological problems uh, and solutions. So the experience it's made with uh, old missions might be of little help for tackling the challenges we are uh, we are currently facing. And then there are unresolved uh, questions such as how to localize missions, how to select missions, how to ensure that the uh, selection process is um, open and inclusive, so that it allows for uh, public participation. How to translate missions into concrete ac actions is another uh, unresolved um, um, issue. And then there, um, there are, of course, also concerns that uh, mission-oriented policies are too demanding for uh, regions with weaker policy uh, capacities or nations with weaker policy capacities. Uh, Mission-oriented approach is imposing extraordinary demands on, on, on policy actors, and regions and countries might really struggle to uh, develop their required um, capacities and to, uh, to, to break with uh, public administration traditions which are uh, incompatible with the uh, complex mission-oriented tasks that governments are supposed to, to execute. And uh, finally, well, needs to be, of course, mentioned that there are different versions or different interpretations of mission-oriented uh, policies, but for those that are inspired by an SDI model, so science and technology-based approach to innovation. So for those uh, versions of mission-oriented policies, one can, of course, critically ask if all regions can uh, in, embrace uh, such uh, an approach. So in what follows, um, 
I would like to say uh, a few words about uh, a potential alternative approach that is uh, perhaps less high tech oriented, uh, only high tech oriented and STI orientated uh, as an approach that could benefit more uh, sectors and regions. And I refer to it as uh, a place based challenge oriented uh, approach. This is based on, uh, on recent work on what we call challenge-oriented regional innovation systems. This is an approach that uh, brings the risk concept and risk policies in closer touch with an alternative understanding uh, of innovation. So it's an attempt to reorient the concept and, and policies to a, a new purpose of innovation. This is so, and this is solving uh, place-based uh, uh, problems uh, and needs. So just to be a, a, a bit more precise, so regarding the, the purpose and the direction of innovation, uh, a challenge-oriented innovation system approach um, adopts indeed a, a broader view and, and complements the exclusive orientation on economic growth and competitiveness with a focus on uh, place-based uh, problems um, and needs. And well, this of course, then comes with uh, acknowledging um, um, a wider set of, of innovations, so not only technological innovation and innovation in the business sector, but also social innovation, institutional innovations. Uh, it comes with the, with the need to, to move beyond uh, the usual suspect of the triple helix actors and to include uh, so-called new innovation agents from civil society, from the uh, public sector, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, then our approach, the chorus approach, also uh, ties in with recent debates on an alternative, uh, uh, on an alternative regional development agenda, one that is less centered on short-term growth and more focused on environmental sustainability and uh, inclusive development. And the approach is also inspired by, uh, by recent contributions that call for uh, paying more attention to the geography of problems. So where some scholars argue that there is not only a geography of innovation or a geography of solutions, uh, but also a, a, a geography of problems. And so different regions have different exposures to environmental challenges, to social challenges, to economic challenges. So they face uh, different challenges. And these region-specific challenges uh, should be key motivations for, um, for policy intervention. So, or as Kuhn and Morgan put it, prioritization should not only be based on entrepreneurial opportunities, but also on uh, place-specific uh, uh, problems uh, and, and needs. So I'm just uh, checking the, how much time is left. Five or ten minutes, David. Um, yeah, five five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. This is. Um, I will I will do my best. So I just want to highlight uh, three aspects that um, are uh, discussed in the literature on chorus policy. Uh, chorus policies. Uh, the first one concerns the question where priorities and directionalities for regional in innovation and development are set in the region or elsewhere. The second one um, uh, concerns the question. So if we want to understand the nature of, of COVID initiatives, then the, the argument is in favor of, uh, of, comprehensive, um, of comprehensive strategies that uh, so not only innovation, but also other core pro uh, processes should require a critical examination would be the argument here. And the third one is uh, re relates to reflections on how um, uh, place-based innovation system structures need to change uh, in order to, um, to enable uh, the core processes that underpin uh, um, challenge-oriented initiatives. So on the um, very briefly on the on 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 the first uh, aspects. So 
kind of priorities set within the region or, or somewhere else. The Corey's approach clearly privileges uh, strategies that are negotiated and cultivated in the region over strategies that, and interventions that are done to the region. So it favors goal setting and uh, the formulation of strategies by regional actors and communities rather than having uh, directionality of change and innovation priorities imposed on them. And then the question is, of course, always, okay, and what we are, what uh, are then the options for less developed regions, in particular uh, weaker regional economies that are located in centralized policy regimes? They are, as we know, very dependent on decisions set at the national level or at the EU level. They strongly rely on funding coming from extra regional sources. And here, uh, I think a, a decent answer would be that, um, uh, in particular for those regions, there is a need for national and supranational policies that provide these weaker economies with the much needed asset support and power uh, that regional actors require to set uh, development goals and design. Um, uh, strategies to tackle the often complex and interrelated place specific problems uh, uh, they are uh, confronted with. So, and then uh, just a few words about the uh, challenge oriented uh, uh, initiatives. Um, and I've already mentioned that we uh, understand. Uh, or th that we think that they should they can best be conceptualized by uh, being underpinned by uh, four core processes. And the, the first one uh, concern, concerns the really, I would say, tricky issue of identifying, framing, and uh, formulating a place-based problem. This process is not straightforward, as uh, argued in a, in a recent paper by, by Flanagan and colleagues. It's, it's a very tricky process. It involves questions such as what is perceived as the problem, uh, which problems are selected as priorities, by whom, and, and how is this done? What are their perception about the, the, um, the roots and effects of these problems? And uh, it's, of course, clear that different stakeholders will have different understandings of this issue, and, and much depends uh, on who is involved in, in these processes, who is shaping the discourse. And there is, of course, always the danger that uh, powerful incumbents with vested interests just capture uh, these processes. And then um, the, the problem framing will, of course, have an impact on uh, the second key process, which is the search for solutions, of, uh, the development or application of innovation and upscaling uh, processes in, in the region uh, and uh, beyond. And this might include uh, development or importation of new technologies, uh, but also the development of non-technological solutions or combinations of both, because um, we know that many sustainability challenges require an integration of a, a range of technological and, and non-technological uh, solutions. And then depending on the case under consideration, also unlocking and exnovation uh, activities might deem uh, important. Um, so the question of uh, revelation and destabilization of unsustainable uh, activities, practices, networks, and institutional structures uh, uh, could be an, imp an important aspect to uh, consider in, in, this challenge, in the challenge-oriented uh, initiatives we are proposing. And this could, uh, this might, of course, involve uh, undermining vested uh, interests and picking the losers, which is uh, can be a, a, a very uh, tricky thing. So, and then I um, think it goes without saying that these three uh, processes come with demanding orchestration uh, needs. So, coordinate multiple actors who populate a uh, particular challenge-oriented uh, initiatives is uh, very demanding because these actors can have very different interests and motivation and discourse for mediation and 
formulation of shared visions and setting collective priorities, uh, horizontal and vertical policy coordination is of course also of central importance. So um, in particular, again, for the for weaker economies, the, the question how to mobilize uh, support from national and um, EU policies is, um, is a, a crucial issue. So, and then I think I will then stop here um, uh, because there are only 10 minutes left, at least at, at my clock. So this is the, here you can see this uh, third dimension or this third aspect that uh, is currently discussed uh, in the literature. It really relates to the question how historically grown a regional innovation system, which um, well, to hardly back ch uh, challenge oriented initiatives. Uh, they are often an unfit for addressing environmental and social challenges. How can these, um, these place-based uh, structures be reconfigured uh, to enhance the capacity of, uh, of regional innovation systems to support several core process of challenge oriented initiatives. And we are currently working uh, on uh, conceptualizing different uh, different routes. So, so far we have, uh, um, we have identified the so-called reorientation route and uh, this can be distinguished from a, a transformation route. And um, so very briefly, reorientation means to enhance the challenge orientation of existing risk elements and functions uh, and a transformation routes very different from, from that. It's more about creating new challenge-oriented uh, risk elements um, and functions. So and this is my, my last slide. Uh, instead of a, a long uh, summary or uh, conclusions, I have um, just, um, um, uh, so I limited myself to, uh, to so to say, to, to summarize what we are currently working on and where the, the next steps are. And in respect of time, I just focus on the on the first part on the slide. So the uh, currently we're uh, working on getting a better understanding of the the nature and geography of the challenge oriented initiatives that I mentioned before. So we're involved in several EU projects where we have the opportunity to map and analyze uh, such initiatives. Um, uh, to better understand how challenge or oriented initiatives uh, evolve over time and um, uh, hopefully then in the, a few months or so uh, we will have a, a better answer to the question uh, what benefits are really produced uh, and for whom so uh, assessing the outcome um, assessing the outcomes of these uh, initiatives uh, is of uh, ranks of, uh, of course very high in Europe. Uh, research agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Hi again, uh, Vasilis Mastigiotis from LSC. Uh, thanks to both for the presentations and very comprehensive, very good pointers for for uh, for, for the debate. Um, I would like to hear your views on uh, the, the following proposition that there's a, the big thing missing in this uh, developing uh, debate is is politics and politics at all levels, the domestic kind of electoral nitty gritty politics, intergovernmental politics at the European level, but also increasingly geopolitics. Uh, you know, the, the big actors and what's happening to our uh, borders and so forth. And, and, and I think this is a fundamental problem because on the one hand, we have a, a policy which had been quite effectively depoliticized. So, okay, they fight in the council, for the allocation of funds, but once that is done, then you have the commission and everything on the cohesion policy is kind of technocratically evaluated and so forth. But then the moment we go to mission-oriented policies, it is problematic at the domestic level, let alone if you think about the European level. You, who, you alluded to who decides on the mission and the, you know, the priorities, the purposes and so forth. The more you go into challenge-oriented stuff, it, it, it involves so many political choices about how you define things. But also how you, if you distribute property rights, who does what and who benefits from that, who can exploit whatever is being uh, uh, kind of the, the extra value that is being produced. So, can I have some response on that? How problematic is that we do not have this discussion? Yeah. 
Michaela, would you like to go first? So if I have understood um, the comment correctly, then uh, challenge-oriented innovation systems are by far more demanding than mission-oriented innovation poli uh, policies. Uh, the, the, view, the question was about whether it involves more political choices. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure whether it involves uh, more political choices. Um, I think it's... Um, it might be more demanding because it's uh, an approach that comes closer to what one could call uh, innovation democracy, because it, um, yeah, so it is it operates at the regional level, and at the regional level you have of course uh, more opportunities to involve more actors who uh, who, who are, are well aware about the problems and the assets and how they could be matched. Um, so yes, might be might be more demanding, but um, the relation to to politics. Um, this is the the thing that I didn't really get about the question. Okay, thanks, Miguel. Lisa, would you like some follow? Thank you very much for your question. I think you're right because when you have to make a decision and selecting and prioritizing and excluding, inevitably it means that you have a view of what is good and what is not worth it. So um, I think politics will become very important and it is me, <coughs> uh, very important, not only in terms of what is ideologically driving these choices, but also the different tier might have different views. So there could be a lot of conflicts uh, even within, within, within countries as uh, things are chosen at the national level and then implemented at the regional level, assuming that there is this distribution of powers, for example. It could be that there isn't. And I think you're right. And the other big issue, which I would add to politics, is that some of these choices are way, how can I put it? They will require more than five years implementation, which is a political cycle. So that is another big constraint that is certainly uh, we will face. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you say who you are, please? Sure. Uh, hi, thanks so much. I'm Brady Reed um, from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Also the RSA blog editors. There is a blog if anyone cares. The RSA Great has blog. a blog, plugging the blog. Um, I do have a question. Um, so thanks so much uh, for the presentation. It was really great. Um, one thing, and this might be because of my generation or because I'm from North America, um, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on, and this is more specifically to the twin transitions maybe than, uh, than the other, but um, what role does maybe taking a bit more of a critical lens on, um, you know, who benefits and who's impacted on those transitions, um, given that, you know, when we think about green and digital transitions, we look at more critical minerals being needed. And so, you know, we see more exploitation, more conflict in uh, maybe the, the global south and other areas. So how how does that play into those that framework that you're thinking of and, and maybe whether, you know, just transitions or other things play in? as well so the, the question is who benefits and how you bring that into and how that how you think about that in, in this sort of framework yeah thank you Michaela do you would you like to come back on that Lisa will pick it yeah, up given it's about twin transition probably it's, it's a fair towards uh, Michaela uh, to some extent I think it is crucial and in fact the one thing that Michaela said it was the geography of problems uh, so we have this geography of problems which doesn't necessarily match the geography of solutions. And that's why when we talk about grand challenges, about mission-oriented, they are important, but they will, in a sense, they overlook the fact that there is a micro scale that needs to be taken into account. There is a level at which it impacts directly on specific locations. And that's where the politics come in. And this is why I think we need to re, really re really shed some light on the, the role of places because otherwise things will really create a, a, a distortion whereby if the problem of places of uh, sorry the geography of problem becomes the geography of the forgotten places then clearly that's not something that is a desirable outcome any more questions Elvira Thank you very much for two really excellent presentations. I share the concern about the kind of top-down, technocratic, over-centralized nature of these mission-oriented uh, policies and the 
a potential detrimental effect on uh, regional disparities. So I think it's a real issue. And I'm, I'll, I'm very glad that you focus on the kind of the nature of problems are different. So therefore, uh, it shouldn't be business as usual with this uh, mission oriented, but we should focus on the kind of contested uh, and situated and context specific nature of problems and the geography of problems, as, as you mentioned. Uh, my question is about the instruments that are derived from these uh, problem oriented um, innovation policy. Because often we change the frameworks, we change the rationales, we change the discourse, but the policies remain the same. So the instruments that are used, still very supply oriented, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the same instruments that are being used. Uh, follow this kind of linear approach, but we give it a different name, but it's the same. So are there any concrete examples of how the uh, uh, policy will look like at the instrument level, at the implementation level? So so a question about uh, what instruments, policy mix. policy mix and instruments, either of you want to? I could bring a little, uh, what I've been doing, for example, with Sweden. I think when I was um, I had these conversations with Vinova about about the way in which they are restructuring their innovation policies towards really having these challenge-driven policies, and whereby basically the argument was, well, if you are good, then you will be involved in, this, in these programs, you will be roped in. And, and to some extent, that's meant that there was already a selection, an implicit selection process. And when I was challenging them, so how are you going to do that? It means you're going to be choosing to leave some locations out. So the instruments that they're using now seems to be more space blind. And so they are, their, their argument, for example, in that particular case, when I was really prompting them was, well, you know, but uh, of course we're going to be fair and we will try to engage locations in the, in the, in the, in the projects when the locations have some uh, uh, have some something to add in terms of other solutions or because they are touched by the problems. But the idea of that was an afterthought, that was really worrying me to some extent. And this is why I, I started to really think about if we take these big challenges within a kind of, the, you know, the horizon Europe is fine. These are really beginning to push the technology. But when we start to mix science and technology policies, with innovation policies, that's what my problem is. And you're right, we can't just rename things and we can't just all of a sudden forget like 30 years of, you know, regeneration system policies. Um, and and I, I also think that adding a fourth dimension to the smart specialization might not be enough to address exactly the change of instrument that you're talking about. Uh, Michaela, do you have anything to add? Um, uh, very briefly, so I, I fully agree that um, uh, not developing new frameworks and then working with the same instruments, which are uh, only supply oriented, this, this wouldn't work. So there, um, if you take a look at, at the, the playbook, the PRI, I mean, there is a, a wonderful list of old and new policy instruments that could bring such a, a a framework to life there is demand side policies, uh, public procurement, regulatory sandboxes, other forms of uh, institutional uh, innovations that could and should be implemented. So, um, so to cut the long story short, uh, working with the same old instruments uh, uh, wouldn't work. So, thank you. Um, we're going to have to finish that. I'm sure we could carry on. So, can we say? Uh, Big thank you to two brilliant speakers. I've learned a lot this afternoon. And and I do I do love a presentation where I learn a new word, which was ex, ex, ex innovation. So thank you. Thank you, Michaela, very much. And thank you, Lisa. John. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Harrison. I'm one of the RSA board members and have the brief for conference and events. And Sally's asked me just to say, two, uh, say a few words in two minutes. Um, just to say thank you um, to all of you for coming and supporting the RSA Winter Conference. And I'm conscious that we have both quantitative and qualitative researchers. So I'm going to try and please both of you uh, by starting with some quantitative uh, statistics. Um, so across the last two days, we've had 190 papers uh, delivered, uh, 225 delegates. Um, 
really important in terms of the, the ethos of the RSA is to be an inclusive association. So it's really pleasing to say that we've had almost 50-50 uh, gender split between female and male delegates. Um, we, we nearly made it 47% female, so uh, we've got a target for next time. Um, also really important um, in terms of we have 43 early career delegates and 34 students. So the, the future of the association is in root health um, and thank you for your support. Finally, in, on this in terms of figures, uh, we had delegates from 32 countries, uh, which many of you will be aware there's a rather large sporting event going on in the next month with 32 countries represented. <laughs> if it's good enough for FIFA to call that the World Cup, I'm calling this a world event. So thank you. Right. For the qualitative researchers out there, I've got a few personal thanks because these events don't happen without the, the hard work of not only all of you as individual delegates for supporting, but uh, people that have, have taken particular roles. Uh, so to Marcin Dabrowski, uh, who's here at the front, you saw at the opening keynote yesterday, uh, Marcin has been the conference organiser for us and has done a fantastic job putting together the plenary and the final second. Obviously, to all the speakers, moderators, uh, chairs, uh, thank you for saying yes uh, when people have asked you to do various things. And um, also to Henry Young. Uh, Henry picked up the a big award last night. Um, so congratulations again, Henry, but thank you for coming to visit us in person to receive the award. Um, also, events like this are so much better if you're having people like you here. I'm still looking for somebody who's got as much energy and enthusiastic support as you. Um, I've been going for about 15 years. I haven't found anybody. Um, and I think what's really important, I think like your involvement in these events, um, your enthusiastic support for research, whether it's from the most senior professor here or an early career researcher or a student, um, it really is unparalleled. So thank you. And we hope to see you again um, soon. Um, to the venue, to the Holiday Inn um, that's hosted us for the last couple of days, um, for feeding us, hosting us, but also the tech support. Without you, uh, these things don't happen, so thank you. Two more things from me. Um, I've not mentioned the RSA team yet. All right, so um, obviously the whole team, but in particular um, to Lisa, to Alex and Nicola, um, who you've seen on the reception desk, and also, I've lost Alex, she's at the front here. And they've done an absolutely sterling job putting this on for us, um, as always. Thank you very much. All of which just leads me to say thank you for supporting the RSA. Thank you for supporting the Winter Conference. Uh, whether on departing this room now, um, you're going to go and catch a plane or a train, or you're simply heading to the bar. Uh, stay safe. Um, don't be strangers. Uh, please join the RSA if you're not already a member. And we look forward to seeing you in Ljubljana next year or another RSA event in the near future. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs>